I come from Africa, and I'm really proud to be an African who is saving African species. There are many, many preconceptions that people have about Africa. It is a poor continent. It's a continent of poverty. It's a continent of starving people. It's a continent of dictators and wars and lots of terrible diseases like HIV and malaria. But I hope that by the end of this talk, you'll start to reimagine the potential in Africa and the opportunities. One of the most infuriating statements I ever heard came from one of Africa's worst dictators, President Robert Mugabe. And I was at a conference in Harare, Zimbabwe, and he was opening the Convention on the International Trade in Endangered Species, CITES, and we were having a fierce debate about whether to reopen the trade in ivory. And President Mugabe, in his opening statement, said, either you use it or you lose it. And this is a really scary statement that a lot of leaders across the world, in the conservation world as well, have this idea that unless wildlife, biodiversity, nature can be turned into dollars, it's not worth keeping. And that just seems really ridiculous to me. Why are we commodifying nature? We don't do it with historical monuments. We don't say, well, actually, that would make a much better parking lot. We could make more money from it, you know? We don't do that with works of art. We don't do it with any human creation, actually, if you think about it. Why do we put nature's creation? You know, it's either or if it makes more money, you know, let's convert it. My introduction to conservation was at a very young age. I left high school and I was completely intoxicated by a book I read by Dr. Ian Douglas Hamilton. It was called Living with Elephants. I don't know if any of you have read it, but it's an extraordinary book about a man who came to Africa, lived with a herd of elephants in Tanzania, and actually got to know them as individuals. What we know about elephants today, you know, it's incredible. They are like people. They live in families. The matriarchs, the mothers take care of them. The children play and they learn from their mothers. The aunts and the sisters take care of all the young. They're just like humans. And it's easy to fall in love with elephants. But Ian hired me not to go to Manyara and not to do research on these wonderful living beasts, but to measure Kenya's ivory stockpile. In 1989, Kenya had 12 tons of ivory sitting in a stockpile. And we measured every single tusk. We measured the length on the outer edge, the inner edge, the depth of the tusks and the circumference. And that information told us about the age of the elephants that were killed and also whether they were males or females. That introduction uh, really depressed me. It was actually very traumatic, because what we discovered was that over the previous 15 years, poachers were killing increasingly younger elephants every year because they'd taken off all the old guys. They were killing baby elephants. They were killing elephants that hadn't even reached adolescence. And as a young conservationist or somebody who wanted to go into conservation, I just thought, you know, there is no hope. Forget it. These animals are going to be extinct in just a few years' time. And then something extraordinary happened. The president of Kenya, who was being urged to sell Kenya's ivory on the international markets to people far away in China who want to have trinkets made of this wonderful substance made of elephant's teeth. And he said, no, we're not going to put our ivory on the markets. That is what's killing our elephants. We're going to burn it. We're going to make a statement to the world. And this really audacious statement where 12 tons of ivory worth many millions of dollars was satellite. And there was my research. It all went up in smoke. <laughs> <laughs> but it was an extraordinary moment for me to realize that actually, if we're going to do conservation in Africa, we have to be audacious. We've got to be courageous, and we've got to think big. The statement that Kenya made by burning that ivory led to a total ban on international trade in ivory. And that lasted for quite a while. But very recently, the trade in ivory has actually been reopened partially. A few countries in southern Africa have been allowed to put their ivory back on the international markets, bought by China and Japan, which, of course, all that has done is exactly what we predicted. Elephants are again in danger because the illegal trade has started up, because we basically have fed the demand for ivory in China. Well, there are 1.6 million people in China who would love to have a piece of ivory. You can't feed that demand from all the elephants in Africa and Asia. There's just no way. Just two weeks ago, I was in a place called Galana, just next to the famous Savo National Park, where this elephant, his name is Achille, was shot by a poacher. There were three elephants together. Um, poachers shot them to get at their ivory. 
Two of them died, but Achille was injured. A bullet went right through his body from one side and out the other. And when we saw this elephant, he was actually wandering about in extreme pain. It was just pure luck that we were there. I called the head of the Kenya Wildlife Service, who sent an aircraft with a veterinarian who's standing there on the right. The veterinarian darted this wonderful elephant, treated his wounds, and revived him. And Achille is fine today. But the cost of that operation is several thousand dollars. Getting that aircraft, getting that vet out there, it was a weekend, treating him, having all the rangers around to protect the place and then to patrol um, and, and try and protect these elephants. And the cost of conservation in Africa is something that is really not appreciated. You know, Kenya can make as many statements as it wants and it can have all the goodwill it wants, but actually financing conservation is very difficult, especially given the fact that most of the wildlife in Kenya is not in protected areas. And the protected areas is where tourists go. That's where the country generates revenue for conservation. But 70% of the wildlife in Kenya doesn't actually live inside national parks. That means that if we're going to save wildlife, not just in Kenya, across Africa, Africa, the last continent with megafauna like elephants, rhinos, lions, and giraffes, we're going to have to work with landowners, not just governments, but landowners and people who live on the landscape with this wildlife. And that's why it's so important to find solutions to living with nature. I do my work through several organizations, and I just want to show you quickly what, what they are. Wildlife Direct is a blogging platform. It allows conservationists anywhere in Africa to tell their stories from the field in very remote and wild places. And it allows us to actually get a glimpse of what's happening as it's happening from the very people on the ground who can communicate with an audience internationally anywhere in the world. And they can help people on the ground to actually do their work by making donations. I also run the Kenya Land Conservation Trust, and this is a national organization that is trying to secure the land that I've just talked about, land outside of protected areas, buffer zones, wildlife corridors, migration areas, dispersal areas, and key habitats for endangered species. And uh, who doesn't love lions in this room? <laughs> dare, dare, I dare you to put your hand up. No, lions are... <laughs> Lions are, um, yeah, one of the most extraordinary species. I mean, I, I've worked with elephants. I adore elephants. Lions are very similar. The only cat in the world that lives in families. Again, I think there's a human connection here that attracts me. This photograph was taken just, you know, a kilometer from my house. I live on the edge of the Nairobi National Park, and this is one of the most extraordinary places in the world. Nairobi National Park is home to about 50 lions, and I wake up, my wake-up call is a roaring of lions. It's just extraordinary. I'm very privileged to live in a place which still has nature like that right on my doorstep. And that's why I'm so passionate about saving it. But this sound, the roaring of lions, is not something that's going to be around with us for very long unless we do something very dramatic to save the large predators, the large mammals of Africa. How many of you have been to Nairobi? Fantastic, wonderful. Well, those of you who haven't, and even those of you who have, you probably are aware that this is one of the most iconic sites of the city. It's from the National Park. Almost everyone I speak to who's been to Nairobi tells me that the, the lasting memory they have of this city is wildlife with a backdrop of the city. It's still a wild place. This is not a zoo. It's 117 square kilometers. It's four kilometers from the city center. And the northern boundary of the park is bound by the city but the southern boundary is open, and the wildlife of this park is migratory. This is what the park looks like. It's just on the southeast edge of the city. This is the purple line is the city boundary, and the national park you know, just rests right there. All of this here is open. There is no uh, fence or barrier that prevents animals from moving out of the national park. Well, Nairobi is the capital city of Kenya, and Kenya is the regional hub of East Africa. This city is right along the Trans-African Highway. That highway takes goods from the port of Mombasa all across East Africa and into the Congo. And that means that this city is actually gearing itself up to be the major industrial and commercial hub for Tanzania, Uganda, Congo, Rwanda, Burundi, Sudan, and Somalia and Ethiopia. The amount of development going on in Nairobi today is actually quite frightening. It's a city that is in a massive state of growth that's financed primarily by the Chinese. 
And very soon, this boundary is going to come all the way around here, and it's going to attempt to come all the way around the bottom. And my biggest concern right now is this road here. That's a highway to take traffic off the Mombasa Highway, south of the city, and back onto the highway up there. And that will allow trucks and major commerce to traverse the country without having to go through the, you know, the quagmire of traffic in the middle of the city. Well, this park is not just a little park that you can cut off with a highway like that. That highway would prevent the movement of wildlife. And this, these lines here represent the movements of wildebeest, zebra, lions, cheetahs, impalas, coax hartebeests. Thousands of animals move out of that national park and into the ecosystem. And all these little blocks down here, although the land is actually quite open physically on the ground, all these little blocks represent individual title owners, landowners who have a piece of land. Most of the people who live here are pastoralists. They live with nature. They have wildlife in their backyard all the time, and they graze cattle out on the plains. Well, what's happening around Nairobi is this massive growth. We're seeing factories coming up, housing estates, which are coming into that area, which is where the wildlife migrates. And one of the scariest things that's happening is the city of Nairobi, which is famed for its slums, like this one is Mathare Valley, the oldest slum in, in the city of Nairobi, where uh, people who have really good intentions are trying to deal with the problem of poverty in these slums and, and the congestion. And so they're they started this great project where they're taking people out of the slum and putting them in places that look wild and open, like that area south of the Nairobi National Park. This is a housing estate for something like 50,000 people. And conservationists tried to fight this project because it's right in the middle of the dispersal area for the wildebeest and all these other species. And so I met this lady here. Her name is Jane. She comes from Mathare Valley. She was a battered wife. She has four children and she abandoned her husband because of the abuse she was receiving, and she went to the city, moved into the slum, into a one room, which is about the size of a prison cell, with her four children. And she ended up um, becoming a sex worker, got HIV, and then she was given an opportunity to move into this housing estate. I mean, when you hear her story, you can't feel for her. Her life is transformed, her children are in a safe environment, but she's right in the middle of the wildebeest migration. And so it's a major problem. Development in the, city of, in the city of Nairobi is actually working against conservation. But the rest of the people in this landscape are pastoralists, Maasai pastoralists, and their lives depend on the ability to move through open spaces because they need to track the rainfall and the grazing. Because of all of the congestion and development in this area, they're actually losing space. They're degrading the landscape. So what we're seeing increasingly is desertification. And when we have droughts, the results are just you know, devastating. And this is a, the result of the drought, the last drought that happened. We lost 80% of the cattle in this area. And what happens is that people become less tolerant of predators when they lose their animals, when their animal herds have become so small. And lions do attack their livestock. And what happens is people then decide to take action. They spear the lions and kill them. And increasingly, they're using pesticides to poison them. And this is just one of those illustrations. Kenya has lost most of her lions. We had 15,000 lions just 20 years ago. Today, there's fewer than 2,000 lions, primarily because of pesticide poisoning. So what's the future for an area like this? How do we balance nature and conservation with development? What should a child growing up in this environment expect? And what about the wildlife? What can they expect? One of the messages I want to make is that in order to protect these wild areas, we don't need to decide that it's development or conservation. I really truly believe that it can be both. What I think is that we really need to think big. We need to be courageous. We need to do things before it's too late. It's going to take some really creative thinking, and that's why I'm hoping that in this audience there are people who have some great ideas and, and uh, resources that we can tap into. We need money, lots and lots of money, to actually put together these plans. <laughs> We've got to build structures like the Banff Highway in Canada, so that animals can cross these massive highways that the government wants to put in. We've got to do proper planning, and we need to make it make sense to landowners to do conservation. And that's how we're going to save wildlife in Africa. Thank you.